Hey guys, we're about to give you my conversation with Elaine Godfrey from The Atlantic about abortion. We taped this show before Ohio passed its constitutional amendment protecting abortion rights and before Andy Bashir won in Kentucky, partly because his Republican opponent was so extreme on abortion and Democrats took full control of the Virginia legislature under threat of an abortion ban. I think the voters in this episode foreshadow all of that pretty well. Enjoy the show, and I'm going to see you guys next week. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Focus Group Podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, and this week we're tackling what's thought to be one of the biggest issues of the 2024 election, abortion. Now, you may remember how in 2022, Republicans ran a lot of candidates whose positions on abortion were considered too extreme for a majority of voters. So I was wondering how voters, especially suburban women who flipped from Trump to Biden, are thinking about the abortion issue as we head into the 2024 cycle. We found an interesting dynamic I want to explore. People do not want extreme restrictions on abortion that many Republicans are pushing. But if Donald Trump is going to be the nominee which, spoiler alert, I'm very sure that he's going to be, uh, he is not necessarily going to make abortion the most important issue for voters. My guest today has written a great deal on the politics of abortion. Elaine Godfrey, staff writer at The Atlantic. Elaine, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Okay. So we haven't talked about the GOP primary on this show for a little bit, uh, but you've been in New Hampshire covering Nikki Haley. You have a piece where you call her campaign rallies the warm waters of an alternate reality, uh, a reality in which Donald J. Trump is very old news. So tell us what you're seeing on the ground, although that is evocative and precise language that I understand deeply. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to go see uh, what was appealing to voters about Nikki Haley. Um, and I went to two of her events, followed her around New Hampshire from one to another, um, and talk to as many people as I could. And these are people who want things to be normal. I had so many people, and I use one quote in the piece, who just said, I just want a Republican that's normal and that knows what they're doing and that doesn't scare me and doesn't insult people. Um, and it was funny how many people, like it, it was a comfortable little bubble of people who thought she really could pull it out and, and be the nominee and, and that Trump, that if they sort of all got behind her, um, maybe they could overthrow Trump in, in this primary. And as you've been on the ground there, does that seem like a realistic option? How big are these things for Nikki? <laughs> they Sorry, are... answer the first one first. How realistic is it? And then you can tell me how big they are for Nikki. Um, how realistic is it? Uh, I think it's plausible, I guess. I just, it, it is very unlikely. Um, it, it just, it, it would require um, Nikki to do really well in all the early states to win, to win South Carolina probably, or just do like, you know, have a smashing success there. And Trump is beating her by 30 some points there right now, even though that's her home state. Um, it would require all of those things. And then it would require basically everyone else in the primary who's sort of more mainstream um, to drop out and get behind her and hopefully their voters would all go towards her. Like it just, there's just a lot of ifs involved. Plus when you're a front runner, you suddenly have all the scrutiny, right? This is her first time being sort of front or close to the front of the primary pack. She's going to have a lot more attack ads to deal with a lot more, um, you know, from other candidates, but also just voters are going to be trying to learn more about her. Um, and she may not sustain her, her, her surge because of that. Um, so I don't know. It just, it, there's a lot of ifs. Um, it doesn't seem likely. Uh, what was the second question? Well, I was just like, so how many people are coming to the Nikki rallies? Like, are, is there suddenly like a surge of interest where more people are showing up because they're curious or are they kind of these small little alternate realities? So I went to one event that was pretty small. Um, you know, they pick small venues so that she can pack them. Yeah. Um, I, I assume. <laughs> so we went to a diner um, and I think that was pretty standard for her. Small, a few dozen people, a couple, I don't know, 50 people, maybe something like that. Um, and then we did have a bigger rally where um, in Nashua, New Hampshire, that was pretty big, but like we're not talking 
anywhere close to Trump size. We're not talking DeSantis size even. Although I guess I, I don't know in New Hampshire the comparison between the two, but I've been to DeSantis gatherings in Iowa, for example, and they are bigger than what Haley got. Um, they're also like a very specific type of person, right? At all of these events, it's like mostly older people, almost entirely white people. Um, you know, so it's hard to say like how she would do in a state that is more diverse. So I don't know, they were not that impressive um, in terms of size. I'll say that. Yeah, I think, I look, I, I'd love to engage in some Nikki Haley fantasy politics. I am, I am prone to it a little bit where I think like, I don't know, she keeps it kind of close in Iowa and like she exceeds expectations. She comes in second over DeSantis and then DeSantis has to stay in because you got to split the Trump vote. But then she does really well in New Hampshire because a lot of these unaffiliated independents actually show up for her. Uh, and they don't really have a Democratic primary going on. Sorry, Dean Phillips. But they don't really have one. So then they come out and vote for her. So she actually does way better in New Hampshire. She's got a little momentum going into South Carolina. And and Scott and Christy and <laughs> Asa Hutchinson with his 0.5%. Like they yeah. drop out and suddenly she's... She's hitting, you know, high 20s uh, or and, and but you're right. Like the, the sort of the fantasy falls apart in South Carolina where like she would have to win her home state because Trump's going to do really well in Nevada. And for it to even be that like she has to win her own state. And I think the chances of that are so small. I think they're so small. But like, you know, we also don't know, like that is several months from now. Trump's court cases have been like pretty crazy. He's been like, all, you know, I, I mean. Things could change. I just I don't see them changing enough where she's suddenly the, the favorite of most GOP voters or GOP primary voters like that just doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't seem likely to me. Well, let's use Nikki to transition to our issue, uh, our topic today of abortion, because Nikki Haley, uh, one of the places she does live in reality is on abortion. Um, and I, I would can think that that would uh sort of help her potentially with voters. And, you know, when I think back to the 2022 midterms, like I said at the top, you had all these Republican candidates like Doug Mastriano in Pennsylvania, Tudor Dixon in Michigan, uh, and they were taking these hardline positions on abortions that had no uh, exceptions for rape and incest. And so it was really common for us to hear throughout 2022 that even Republican pro-lifers were super uncomfortable with that stance. Let's listen to how people were talking about it last year. I am a pro-life advocate. I support it as a Catholic and everything else. I'm dead against it. But then you you have people that come to you and say, well, what happens if there was incest and there was rape and now there's a child involved? Well, thank you for painting the most grotesque version of what we're talking about. I'm sure there will be some laws in place to protect that individual. I don't doubt that. There's some common decency that has to happen with that. I'm a Republican because I feel like I align with most of their values. I can tell you on abortion, no, yeah, I feel different than let's say what the party line is, but that's okay. You know, I, I don't feel like I should be forced to do, oh, I'm a Republican. You must do everything Republican says. Absolutely not. It's not going to make me vote for someone else, you know, but if a lot of these would build up or I'd feel different, then who knows what will happen in the future. The Republican platform seems to be and these governors around the country are, you know, banning abortions and then your neighbors can report you if you get one it sounds like a science fiction movie from 1972 that's one thing i disagree with i am pro-life but i'm also understanding why women you know in, in whatever situation they might find themselves in can feel like that's their only option because even my husband and i were talking about that last night we're like you know what do you do if there's a 13 14 year old who can't provide for this child who can't do all of these things and all of these people who, you know, are like myself or pro-life, I would hope at least that they're, if this were to get overturned, they're willing to come alongside these people and say, let us support you. You know what, if you need financial support, we're here for that. So all of those people are 2020 Trump voters. A lot of them were two-time Trump voters. Hmm. And this is something that is really common in Republican focus groups, Trump voting focus groups, is that people have very nuanced positions on abortion. Uh, and I, I think I, I hear this line all the time. I think I've said it to you actually um, before, which is because I was sort of laughed the first time I heard it when people are like, well, I'm, 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 uh, I'm pro-life, but I believe in a woman's right to choose. And I was like, okay, well, how's that work? But actually, that works. That's a lot of people. I just hear it over and over again where they are both, they are personally pro-life, 
but and they want a culture of life. But they also understand that there's a lot of caveats to this, a lot of nuances, and they are very uncomfortable with overturning Roe v. Wade and for women not to be sort of in charge of these decisions. Um, So you've written about how pro-lifers are like mad at Donald Trump after he seemingly blamed uh, them for the Republican Party's losses in the midterms early this year and criticized the six weeks ban like the one Ron DeSantis passed in Florida. You wrote, uh, most Americans support access to abortion. Trump is the only real contender among Republican presidential candidates acting in a way that acknowledges that fact. So I I would argue, I guess, Nikki Haley does too. But why don't you explain, because I think you're 100% right about this. Why don't you explain how Donald Trump approaches abortion and why that seems to land with voters? Yeah, this is, I've spent a lot of time thinking about how Donald Trump thinks about abortion and and whether he's pro-choice or pro-life and what he's trying to project. And I think, um, I think the way he thinks about it is, I mean, I, I, I guess it doesn't super matter personally what he is, although I think, you know, we've known previously in his, in his past life as a Democrat, he was pro-choice. Um, but I, I think he's thinking about what can I sort of project that will let voters think what they want of me. Like he wants voters to look at him and see what they want to see. And so he's done a lot of waffling on abortion. He's the guy who appointed the justices who took down Roe v. Wade, but he's also the guy who won't commit to a really strict ban, right? He condemns strict bans. So he's able to sort of have it both ways by saying, I don't like abortion or, or, you know, I think that abortion should be up to the states. We, we shouldn't do it federally. Now it's in the state's hands. I wash my hands of it. Um, I, I'm not talking about strict bans. I'm not talking about exceptions. Like it's up to the states. And I think that that gives him a lot of room to maneuver and it gives voters um, a lot to see in him. Right. It, it gives voters a chance to think what they think. Um, and, like that is smart. <laughs> that is like politically a smart position. And I, I, I agree with you. Yes, I, I think that um, Nikki Haley has honed her position on abortion um, in a way that I think is more it, it, it's better now than it was. It's clearer now than it was, I should say. Um, it's much more co- more coherent. Her sort of launching of her position was sort of murky and messy. And now she she sounds more like Trump when she talks about abortion, more moderate and voters love it. Voters love that. Um, and I think at least, you know, the, the Republican voters that I talked to did. Yeah. I mean, this is the thing that I'm, I'm worried. We're going to keep talking about this uh, as we go through this, because I think Democrats talk about they are watching these special elections. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about this Ohio special elections that's coming up uh, around abortion. And they keep winning them. They keep winning uh, the abortion question when it's the only question. Right. Uh, but I. And look, if Ron DeSantis was the Republican nominee, I think abortion would be central to the conversation that we'd be having in 2024. But I do not think Democrats have quite wrapped their heads around the fact because they think, to to your point, like you just said, well, okay, but he nominated those three judges that overturned Roe v. Wade. And they can hang that around his head. I I mean, I think that they can hang that on and they'll have to. It's a really important uh, thing to remind voters of. But I don't know that people, because it's a tough thing to explain. You're like, yeah. I know he appointed those judges, but he just doesn't read super pro-life to voters <laughs> like low info voters, swing voters. They view Trump as a cultural moderate because of his previous life, uh, because of the fact that everyone knows this is a guy who has no sense of sexual morality. Like they don't believe for a second that this is a pro-life person. It's the same way everybody kind of just like fakes it through the Bible stuff. Like when he does like a fake Bible verse, it's just like, okay, sure. You checked that box, but we all know that's not really who you are. Um, Anyway, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just confirming your point. I don't know if there's something you want to add to that. No, he's very good at making voters think he's socially moderate. And I think, I think he is frankly, like, I, I think that I think he's good at it because he is right. Like Mm -hmm. you, you hear Mike Pence talk and you know what that dude thinks about, you know, all kinds of social issues, but like, in in, the same way you hear Trump and you think, okay, do you really like, you know, do you really hate abortion like this there's no way and and like i don't know if we're going to talk about this later but the the 
everyone in the focus groups, when you asked, like, you know, what do you actually, what is, what does Trump think about abortion? They're all like, oh, he's pro-choice. Even the people who like support Trump were like, yeah, he's pro-choice. He's probably paid for abortions. <laughs> like, yeah, everyone seems to have this implicit understanding whether they like Trump or not. Uh, 100%. No, we're going to play some of those clips because they are extremely telling. But some of them were hand raises. And so we don't have, you know, audio of that. And so, yeah, yeah, we asked just like, do you think he's a moderate? Everyone's like, raise their hand. I think yeah. we're like, do you think he's extreme on abortion or moderate on abortion? And everyone picked moderate. Um, all right. So I want to but I want to talk quickly, though, about swing voters on this, because, you know, what's interesting, too, on this point of like, how much is this going to be an issue? Swing voters never bring up abortion yeah. uh, when just organically. Uh, now, this was kind of true in 2022, though, as well. Like, if you just don't ask about it, it doesn't often come up because the economy always comes up first. Like, this is what people care about. But when you ask them about it directly, they get super worried about it. They have this, like, sense of disquiet about how the future of abortion rights in America. Let's listen. I would live with two grown females who are women's livers. Abortion, the number one thing on my girls list. And they have they've been right. I can't say they're wrong. I read a story the other day where this father raped his 13 year old daughter and she had to have the baby. That is disgusting. Like, what in the hell? You know, so it's like, I don't know. I just want everything to make sense. I want everything to be safe. I want everybody to have a choice. Every circumstance is different, but I'm just disgusted that it's like limited. I think it's ridiculous. I have two boys, 19 and 21 in college, mm -hmm. you know, the virile ages of boys and stuff. So heaven forbid a girl gets pregnant or something, you know, that's a life decision. And I'm in Arizona. We're one of the worst in the country because, you know, with all our stuff. So, yes, I can go to California and other places. And uh, again, it's just not fair to have generally the white Christian man make choices for us ladies when this is health care. All these states are individually deciding. And I think that part is weird as well because it should be like a united front. I don't like how some states are like, no, and this is the rule here and you have to go whatever. It's like, what if there's an emergency situation, but you're in a state that has a negative whatever, like that's ridiculous. Well, I just think I'm really concerned on a federal level because if we get a president in there that say like DeSantis, they could try to flip that. And then it's the whole United States. Then there's no place safe. So you wrote a piece back in June with the headline, it's abortion stupid. Uh, and you wrote about how Democrats are playing into the swing, this this swing voter fear, the one we just heard. Um, and you talked about how they're trying to put this issue on the ballot in as many states as possible in 2024. At the same time, Republican governors like Brian Kemp in Georgia, Mike DeWine in Ohio, won pretty comfortably in 2022, despite passing very restrictive abortion laws. So what do you think is like, can you tease this out for us? Like, do you think that... Democrats are overconfident in how this plays and they're overstating the electoral benefits or how do you think it's going to work? I think this is not a number one issue for many voters. And I think when it's all wrapped up in other things, this is not what makes most voters go to the polls unless this issue is by itself. So I think, I mean, this is, this is what you said earlier, like, it, if, if voters can go to the polls in Ohio, and um, I, this is a very straightforward issue for voters in Ohio, they can go, they can vote to add an abortion amendment to their constitution or not, the, the right to abortion. Um, but it just is not... It, 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 even with voters I talk to, like Nikki Haley voters, Trump voters, um, this is just not their number one thing. Um, and I, I guess I don't, it, it's hard for me to square the results of 2022 because I know that abortion was very important to a lot of voters, but I think that actually it was sort of extremism in general, Republican extremism in general that got people to the polls. Um, a lot of the election denial stuff because that was our first election since January 6th, right? So like, I, you know, th that I think was a bigger factor. Um, not that abortion wasn't, obviously, but um, I don't know. It's really hard to tease out. Um, but, but again, I think it does better as an issue on its own. 
Yeah. I, I 100% agree with that. And, and also on 2022, so it's funny because I move in this democracy community where people kind of want to be like, it was because of democracy and defending democracy. And then you hear the abortion people say, well, it was the abortion, you know, question. And I was like, mm, it's sort of like the Republicans nominated lunatics yeah. who took extreme positions on abortion, extreme yeah. positions on election denialism, and also like wrote letters to the Unabomber. And so like they just all, it all wrapped up into this package of these guys are nuts. Look at this weirdo. And like Democrats, to their credit, sort of put up your Mark Kelly's yeah. um, and like boring Katie Hobbs, who was like not a good candidate, but like inoffensive in the way that Carrie Lake was deeply offensive, right? And so I think that that's what was going on. And so people who are like, no, it's this thing. I think that like, well, voters kind of like, they get the vibes of the aggregate. And so the the teasing it out to like, is it exactly this is hard, but that's why abortion, and I'll say this, one of the things I talked about in 2022 is there was, um, there was a, it started to become conventional wisdom sort of towards the end that Democrats were talking about abortion too much. And I actually disagreed with that in because of this reason, because for me, what I felt like I heard in the focus groups is I don't think about abortion unless you ask me about it or unless it's like you make it top of mind for me. But the second you put it top of mind, I'm like, oh, yeah, I don't like that. Um, and so I actually thought it was good. I thought it was right for Democrats to remind people of this. And I think that the challenge uh, of 24 in making it an issue is going to be that Trump just isn't the Blake Masters of uh, is doesn't isn't the same as Blake Masters and is going to talk about like he's going to point it at the far right. It's going to point it to Sant not even the far right, whatever that means. It's just going to point at people like DeSantis to be like that's crazy, like he's already doing. Um, and so I want to dig it. I want to dig into this just like a little bit more. This idea about the way people talk about um, the economy. And so we asked women in the focus groups. Um, how they prioritized abortion relative to other issues. So some of these women voted for Trump in 2020, some voted for Biden, but we found that the economy was more top of mind. So let's hear how a fairly pro-choice crowd talked about it, starting with one woman talking about her vote in 2022. I wasn't even really thinking about it, to be honest with you. I mean, I'm more interested in the economy and getting things back to how it used to be somewhat I mean, no matter what I would have probably done, I probably wouldn't have done anything anyway. That's how I thought of it back then. So mm -hmm. I didn't really think that my vote was going to be something that would be life changing. The mortgage interest rates are just over the top. I feel sorry for the young kids. You know, they said they were raising the rates. They keep raising them and raising them. And it's not helping the housing market by me at all. You know, the houses are still high. They're higher than they were. And the rates are still extremely high. And, you know, I have two kids out of college as well. And, you know, I heard another parent say that they want their, you know, sons and daughters to be able to buy homes. And it's just not possible. So I'm still mainly focused on the financial side of things. So thinking about taxes, the economy as a whole, jobs that definitely need filled because so many places are understaffed and short staffed that could adequately be staffed, but aren't. So the economy obviously would be number one, just the whole taxes, getting the inflation under control, education, making sure parents are aware of what's going on in that. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I hear anything with bailing out people, it's not my vote. We're just having too much of that. So here's the thing that's interesting to me. Uh, now, this is like super typical, by the way, just like people talking about the economy. That's just where people's heads are right now. And as much as it looks good on paper or we're getting better, this is just how people sound. Mm -hmm. But these also like a lot of these guys are sort of middle aged um, and they are talking about things like mortgages and interest rates, education, et cetera, because they're in their 40s and 50s. Talk to me about young people, though. Like, is it possible that for the younger set – uh, it's easy for a 50-year-old woman to maybe say, like, I'm not really thinking that much about abortion. But what about a 25-year-old woman? Would it is it going to be mobilizing for that set? Because right now that's a set that I think the Democrats are super worried about. Yeah. I think it is more mobilizing for that set, for younger women. Um, younger voters I voters I talk to generally cite that. And younger men, um, younger, younger voters in general cite that. Um, yeah. Um, as a number one issue. 
is it going to be mobilizing? I mean, it's really hard to mobilize young people. Um, I mean, the, I guess in the 30s, like, yeah. I mean, I think I think that this is where you're right. The Democrats have to, um, w- with Trump, they're going to struggle. But with, with candidates who've said extreme things about abortion, supported extreme bans, strict bans, no exceptions, et cetera, like they're going to have to emphasize that hard to get these people out. Um, yeah, I mean... It, Will it be, I, I think they should worry about this group, um, but but I think that they like know what they need to do to get this group out. Um, like uh, the extremism plays well with them um, for sure. And just sort of the this this general like moving backwards idea, like like, um, you know, voters I talk to, it's it's more about what it says about a candidate when they support abortion restrictions. Like it just makes them seem sort of old fashioned, sort of like just way more conservative than even young Republicans are today. And so I think that that is something Democrats will have to stress a lot. And I don't think I don't think they're too confident. I think that <laughs> I think Democrats I've talked to about their abortion messaging are nervous. So I, I I mean, I think that they're right to emphasize abortion, but I think that they will struggle with Trump for sure on in, in making Trump uh, seem extreme to these younger voters. I don't know how they do that, frankly. Yeah. Did I suggest Democrats were confident? Because let me just rephrase if I did, because I have yet talking, talking with De- like now that I talk to more Democrats, right? I spent the first part of my career really just talking to Republicans. Republicans were like always confident they're going to win and Democrats are never confident they're going to win. It's just a, it is a different world, different, some something different in the DNA where, uh, you know, I, uh, yeah. Just the Democrats are never confident. Republicans always are. I don't yeah. know why that is. The panic is uh, high all the time. <laughs> all the time. Yeah. All the time. Uh, so I want to turn to Ohio. Um, so as of this taping, Ohio is about to pass a constitutional amendment, issue one, that would prohibit the state from banning abortion before the point of viability, which is thought to be in the 22 to 24 week range. The state could still ban abortion after that point with exceptions for the life and health of the mother. If issue one fails, it would allow the state to pass more restrictive abortion laws, possibly including the six-week ban that briefly went into effect after Dobbs, but is still tied up in the courts. Before the vote, we talked to a group of Ohio women who voted for Democrat Sherrod Brown for Senate in 2018 and then Trump for 2020. And it's pretty easy to see why this issue is likely to pass. Let's listen. If they're going to force women to do things and not have a choice in it, then they need to go after the other side and force child support and force men to take care of their responsibilities and force jail time, if that's the case, and force it on the other side, because I feel like it's all one-sided. There's still a choice, but there's a cutoff. I do believe that there should be something, because that's pretty far, you know, 22 weeks, that's pretty far along. But yes, I want there to be a choice. Sometimes the woman, the mom doesn't even know she has a condition that she could die from. So yeah, I like the cutoff too. Like it shouldn't be forever. But if there is this horrible disease that pops up, even I think they should have a choice, you know, and then the medical marijuana I'm okay with too. I definitely think pro-choice, but there's a certain point where, I mean, it's almost like a person. So I don't think you should cut off past 22 weeks. I'm mostly pro-life, but again, I think there are circumstances and nobody can decide for that person. Like people have found out, you know, they had cancer and need a treatment and they couldn't do the treatment. So like to have to make that decision is just hard. And for someone to say, you don't even have that decision to make. I don't agree with that. I'm definitely pro-life if it's at all possible but i actually have one of my kids is a doctor in that field and to outlaw abortion to save the mother's life is just insane and somebody who is like 10 or 12 or a rape victim they don't know at six or eight weeks you know and it's going to get to the point you can't even give them options if all the states around us are also outlawing it you know, I've now done a lot of groups with women about abortion over the last, you know, four years or so. 
And one of the things that's amazing to me, specifically when you talk to women, it's it's true of men too, but like women especially, how much they understand the nuances of this subject. Like they understand, they know somebody who had an outlier event, right? Where like, it's just not that simple and they will tell you about it. Um, And so people do seem kind of to be most comfortable with this idea of, I want to cut off. I want it to be late enough that people would definitely know they were pregnant um, and like that they understood what was happening. But I also want even at that point for there to be exceptions for, you know, rape, incest, life of the mother. And it also seemed that maybe maybe you know about this, that there was right after the Dobbs decision, there was this horrible story of a 10 year old rape victim in Ohio who had to travel to Indiana to get an abortion. It seemed like that sat with people like they heard that and that was true in Michigan too like Michigan Tudor Dixon early on said that she would that that a kid who was raped like a 12 year old who was raped would have to carry a baby to term and like people are like absolutely not on that stuff so um yeah what have you seen in your reporting on that yeah I mean well I'll say like listening to these clips people like voters don't often talk in nuance, like voters don't always have nuanced perspectives on things. Um, On this issue, they absolutely do. Because like you said, everyone (laughs) knows someone who's dealt with this. Like there were like five different examples, rape, cancer treatment, like all these different things that could happen. Like women are well aware of why people get abortions um, and and why this, this is an option. And like, yeah, when I talk to people and polling bears this out, your focus groups bear this out. Um, when I talk to people, they say always, almost always, like I'm pro-choice or I'm pro-life personally, but there should be a choice and there should be a limit. And 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 that, I mean, that's what Roe v. Wade was, which is sort of the interesting thing about all this is like 22 weeks was sort of the limit then as well, viability. But um, people support that. People, people want to limit, but they want the option. Um, and I, I think that it is strange to me that so many Republican nominees, Republican candidates aren't saying that, right? Like aren't acknowledging this nuance as well, um, aren't supporting 15 weeks or 22 weeks limitations because they just seem like they would be so much more successful if they did because that's where most voter most voters seem to be right yeah totally and actually you know uh we heard a lot of talk in these things about the upper limits on allowing abortion yeah. right people did want that but you wrote a piece this past spring about a physician in Colorado who's one of the few that specializes in these late term abortions mm-hmm. uh and he's pretty hardcore about his moral comfort with them so tell us can you tell us a bit about your experience talking to that guy and how the pro choice side can keep together a coalition that includes him and these women who are more conservative in their orientation right like how do pro choice activists deal with that tension yeah i mean this is one of the hardest things pro choice activists have to deal with is is the fact that um, late abortions happen. Um, they are not very common, obviously. Um, they're, they're you know, 9% or something of abortions, uh, 10, uh, X percent, they're small. Um, but this man is a Dr. Uh, uh, Hearn in Colorado. Um, he performs abortions uh, only in the third trimester of pregnancy. And um, they're often for fetal abnormalities, horrible diagnoses that you find out later in pregnancy. But they're also for children who don't know they're pregnant, who've been raped, who've, you know, had sex uh, as kids and, and they don't know they're pregnant till it's too late. I mean, there's there's all these scenarios um, that he provides abortions for. They're also just women who suddenly realize like, oh, I can't support a baby. I'm, I have to get an abortion at 30 weeks or whatever it is. And he'll do it. And his argument is, um, this is not a person. My my allegiance is to the person, the, the, the woman who is the fully fledged human who makes the decision. He's taking the pro-choice argument to its most logical conclusion, right? To its furthest conclusion. Um, and I just thought he was fascinating because people sort of, I think the pro-choice, pro-choice movement would really like to not talk about him um, and, and these kinds of procedures. They're very difficult to talk about. They're difficult to justify. Um, voters don't like them. Most voters do not support or understand, frankly, what abortion in late pregnancy looks like, why it's done, what it's for, that kind of thing. Um, how do they reconcile that they ha- that these abortions happen? 
I think that they emphasize the nuance, right? They emphasize uh, uh, pro-choice activists have to emphasize um, the nuance of why you might get an abortion this late and hope to appeal to voters' sense of understanding and willingness to like embrace nuance. Um, but I think, I don't know if they'll be successful. I mean, you we already have viability limits in a lot of states. Um, people don't like late-term abortion. They don't like thinking about it. Um, Nikki Haley famously, not famously, I guess, <laughs> famously to me, but um, she, part of her stump speech is always, um, I'm personally pro-life, but I don't judge if you're pro-choice, but can't we all agree that late-term abortion is abhorrent? And everyone says, yeah, and they clap. And, you know, I think that's where most voters are. I think it's going to be a real challenge um, for Democrats to, to like defend that position. I don't know Democrats that do that really well. I don't know pro-choice activists who figured out how to build a big tent that includes people who don't want limits and people who want limits. Right. Um, I, I don't know that they're doing a very good job of that right now. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. I think that's because there's something about us as human beings, right. That, so like, cause I was listening to you talk about the scenarios and I was like, okay, yeah. Tell me at 30 weeks that it was a 12 year old who was raped. She gets an abortion. Like I'm just, I'm making my own moral calculation. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me that it's, um, fetal abnormality, something that is just horrific for the parent. Like, absolutely. Like these, they tell me it's somebody who's decided at 30 weeks that they can't financially support the baby. I'm suddenly like, mm, well, this is where adoption is a great option. Um, yeah. because you know, it does. And this is where I think part of where this doctor is butts up against for a lot of women, actually, the experience that they have. Um, I didn't uh, carry children myself, but my wife did. And when, you know, the baby's kicking and stuff and you're like, you're talking to like, it's just, um, I, I am like, uh, the, the I, I think that's why you have the exceptions in there. You have the exceptions for rape. You have the exceptions for the life of the mother. I don't know that the exceptions for like, I don't feel like doing this anymore, like feels great to people and it doesn't yeah. feel great to me. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know uh, that that does. You're right. I would, I would struggle. I wouldn't want necessarily, um, I think it's good to have doctors who have a clear sense of like, I will certainly do this for the 12 year old rate victim. I will certainly do this yeah. for the, I think that the, the moral calculation though, overall, um, I'm not sure I can quite get there with him. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that people did not like that story because he's, yeah. I mean, he's, he is, it is hard to wrap your brain around what he does. And like, yeah, I mean, a lot of people, most people, frankly, disagree with what he does. Um, but, and I, I think it's interesting too, a lot of pro-choice activists and, and, you know, people who are pro-choice will say, well, only late term, late term abortions only happen um, for health reasons or or rape and incest reasons. And that is frankly not true. Um, in fact, Dr. Hearn told me that the opposite is true. Most actually happen for reasons other than than um, health, health reasons, right? Um, and, and I think wrapping your head around that is complicated for people and very difficult. And like, I'm, I'm surprised Republicans haven't like, and they have to a certain extent, but like really latched on to those extremes of Democrats, right? Um, and force them to sort of account for that. Uh, I, I think that, I think that they might get somewhere if they did that. It's like such a weird tick of this Republican party is like, rather than, because I think they do argue about the extreme on abortion, but it's like, they say this thing about they abort a baby after it's been born. And like, they say this cartoonish yeah. things that nobody's like, that's not a thing that happens. Like, no. No. You're not executing children after they come out. Um, no, you don't have so, to make up something. Like you have yeah. real things you could criticize. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't understand that. Uh, well, and, and this is where, I mean, this is where nationally, like this Ohio thing seems like, I don't know, kind of like where the country seems like it would land, right? Is Is that we didn't like the heartbeat bill. That was too extreme. But 22 weeks plus the exceptions, 
feels about right to me. Uh, not not me, Sarah, but that feels like the voter. I mean, it actually feels okay to me too, but like the voters really feel like that's where they are. Yep, 100%. Every, you know, Democrats, like the, there's also a whole, like uh, we, we're talking about generations here. I think any limit like that might be harder for younger people, but older people, my mom, pro-choice, you know, MSNBC lib, loves Rachel Maddow. She wants a limit, right? Because she like understands that there should be some sort of, you know, at, at 22 weeks, that seems reasonable to her. And I think she's sort of representative of a lot of people. Um, and and I just, I, I think that's a very consensus position at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, more bills like this, I mean, could go a long way. People might not like it for their, but like, could go a long way to healing, or not healing, but like taking one of these deep, deep dividing issues off the table if we could have more states pass a consensus issue. But like this to me, this 22 week thing in Ohio is like the kind of thing I could see Donald Trump trying yeah. to do, like get through. And I, I will say the pro-life movement, the anti-abortion activists will not be happy with that, right? They find 15 week bills just awful, abhorrent, because, you know, it's still most abortions still happen before 15 weeks, right? And so their point, I mean, they have argued many times in interviews to me, like a six week ban is ideal, because that's before most occur, most occur what somewhere between like seven or eight weeks and 15 weeks. Um, and, and they're, they would not be satisfied with that. So I don't know if that would take their rage off the table at all. Um, if more laws like this were passed, because they want to get rid of abortion. Um, and so you're always going to have that wing of the party pushing for that. Yeah, well, sometimes hardcore activists on both sides, if they're unhappy and 86% of Americans are happy, like it's maybe where we should be more often. Yeah. Uh, but what do I know? I'm just, I'm just, I'm just talking for the voters here. No, it's uh, right. <laughs> And and so I want to go. Um, uh, I, we promised some sound of uh, of the these these swing voters um, who understand that the way that what Trump did, where he made his alliance with pro lifers, that resulted in Roe getting overturned. Like they know he did that, but they also know he's not of the pro lifers, uh, and they don't seem too scared that he's going to push for a national abortion ban. Let's listen to some swing voters. I'm a hundred percent sure he's pro choice. He became pro-life to run as a Republican. I wouldn't be surprised if he's even paid for abortions himself. I think if, let's say, one of his daughters got pregnant and she wanted to get an abortion, I'm sure he'd pay for it and drive her himself. For other people, there's a chance he doesn't care. But I think personally, he is pro-choice. I think well, Mike's right, but he put the right people in the Supreme Court for the people that want a pro-life sort of realignment. Whatever, whatever his base thinks that his audience wants him to be yeah. at the moment. Yeah, yeah. you never seem to give a straight answer. I don't he think he forever. cares one way or the other. No, I really he, don't either. No, he's paid he, for um, a few abortions in his lifetime, ladies. Let's be real. He's the one who, you know, brought some of these guys into the Supreme Court because that's he, what he thought would brought, get him the vote. He was right. not. None of that was I don't think his Roe own <laughs> position on it. He was just, that was a business deal. I'll it's give you like what you time. want if you give me the votes I need. He's going to have to kind of weave his way in between. It's a losing issue because a lot of Republicans throughout the country just went too far with it, practically almost banning abortion totally. But then he put the justices on the bench who made that happen. And so... That's a tough one for him. He's got to kind of play both sides. Well, I don't think necessarily personally he has a strong opinion about it. I think he's absolutely aligned himself with the far right base on that issue. And um, a lot of issues, I think that he's gone pretty extreme right. And um, I think that would continue for him. He has to for the evangelical base. If he doesn't align with the pro-right group, evangelicals will drop him in an instant because they know morally he's deficient. Okay. 
So first of all, the funniest thing in this one is the idea that Trump would actively drive one of his daughters somewhere if they got an abortion, <laughs> as opposed to just being like having, I don't know, somebody else like that he'd be involved at all in this uh, like parenting decision. Uh, in so the car, no. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Uh, but but they sort of do have his number on the idea of like, this is a guy making a deal with people that he needs to ally himself with for political reasons. And deep down, they just don't think he means it, which means that they're not that scared of it. But you do hear some people kind of being like, well, this alliance with the far right. Like, so I guess my question, I'm not asking you to be like a Democratic strategist or anything, but I guess I do wonder how, how do Democrats, as you've been reporting on it and, and looking at this issue, how do they effectively hang this issue around Trump if voters don't really view him as threatening and he also comes out for a um, like a national abortion ban that seems reasonable? Yeah. I mean, that is the worst case scenario for Democrats. If Trump comes out for like a 22 week or 15 week, even 15 week ban, I think I think that sounds reasonable to a lot of people. That's going to be hard for Democrats to paint him as extreme. Um, I think what they do, what, they, what they've told me is like, you know, talk as much as possible about how he proposed or how he nominated these justices who 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 got rid of Roe v. Wade. Um, I guess talk about how he's really unpredictable on this issue. He's flip flopped so much. You can't trust that he's not going to pass something stricter because he has no principles. Right. I think that's what Democrats would say is like, seriously, you don't like at least with Ron DeSantis, we know what we're going to get. It's going to be bad. And we know what we're going to get with Trump. It could be anything like I think that it's a harder case to make for sure. But I think that that's what they do. It's like I, I, but I don't know, because the, <laughs> Trump gets into office he doesn't have to appeal to anyone. If he's president, this is it for him, right? He's not going to go for re-election after this. So I think that there's also this element of like, he's not beholden to pro-life groups anymore. He's not trying to get re-elected. Um, so there's the reverse argument, which is like, he has, he doesn't owe them anything. He doesn't have to do any of that. He can, you know, build the wall or whatever he's doing as wants to do most as president. Um, yeah, this is this is very tough. And like, I was talking to Kellyanne Conway recently about this. I talked to her for that story and and mm -hmm. have been following her advice to him. And this is her advice to Republicans and to Trump right now is propose a 15 week ban or 20 weeks or whatever it is um, that's that's later and sound really reasonable. You're not going to get that. Democrats can't get you on this. And I think that she's kind of right. I don't really know how they, I don't know how they do it other than, you know, to hang that or the, the Supreme Court around his neck. Um, and I, I also frankly just think that like, people know Trump by now, like they, like, this isn't going to change anybody's mind. I don't think, tell me if I'm wrong. Like, like who's uh, swing voters know him. They, they have his number. <laughs> so I'm not sure they're going to be persuaded that he's, you know, I don't know, one way or another on this. Yeah. And that's why I asked the question about young people, because, yeah. you know, I do think that there's a lot that's baked on this issue and others uh, with swing voters and that it actually a lot of this. Um, I Look, I think you got to persuade on for a fight on the persuasion side. That's uh, in, you know, that's work that I do and that I care about. Yeah. But I also think that a lot of it for Biden is is just an enthusiasm problem. And yeah. I guess if I were trying to build a strategy that increased turnout among sort of less enthusiastic voters, this would be an issue I would put on the top of that. Yeah. The problem is, is that Trump doesn't create the same motivation that a Ron DeSantis or somebody else does. Yeah. And so it's just going to I think that as as we I, I look. I can I could end up being wrong because we don't know the the issue and Ohio hasn't passed yet. But I presume it's going to be a win for uh, the 22 weeks and this sort of moderate version, which will overrule right this like six week uh, thing that they that they had before, and that'll just be another win for sort of the pro choice side of things. And I think that that might be giving people a slightly false sense of potency for this issue for when it comes to battling Trump. But I, I was, I've watched your reporting on this and I've been interested because you have made, 
you have covered a lot about how this has been a catalytic issue in a lot of these other states and Democrats clearly are using it as a strategy to put it on ballots wherever they can. And so I guess I've, I guess I'm just trying to, I'm wondering, I'm wondering strategically, like how much this issue can be used as a mobilizing effort. I think it still can be mobilizing. Um, I think they have to, if, if it's Trump and they want young people to show up, they have to also just talk about how he's unpredictable and extreme on lots of things. I think that like, that, yeah. And, and say, you know, he, he has no principles. He doesn't care. You know, maybe, maybe one way is to say the house is really conservative. If Republicans get Congress and then we have, we have Trump as president, he might sign anything. Like maybe it's not his idea to pursue an, a national abortion ban, but we have a really, you know, pro-life, very conservative house. Uh, you know, they might give him something really strict and you know what? He might sign it because he doesn't care. Like, I think that there's just this sort of, and I think that Trump is really, he's really proud of being the most pro-life president in history or whatever he calls himself. He says that about himself. So maybe he wants to cement his legacy. Um, maybe he wants to pursue this kind of thing. Um, I guess, so one other thing, pro-life activists have told me we don't necessarily see a ban passing. We're not really pursuing that. Um, we see a federal ban. Um, we see the Comstock Act as our next move. Like, oh, sorry, you're gonna have to tell me what that is. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Well, I mean, yeah, it's it's a little in the weeds, but like, this is uh, the 1873, I think, um, legislation that banned the, the, the sending of like contraception and, you know, scandalous things in the mail. And they want, so, so they want Trump to tell his Department of Justice to enforce this law. Um, and, and ban people from being able to sell, um, send abortion pills, abortion equipment through the mail. So, so this is a, this is their next move. Um, I think this is more important to them or more plausible to them than a national ban, a federal ban. I think that's super interesting because I, I think that Democrats would love if, right. So to me, the danger from Trump is that Trump says, I'm going to propose this 22, 20 week, 22 week thing that makes me look incredibly reasonable. And that puts Democrats on the defensive of having to explain why you do an abortion after, you know, up in the 20s and 30s and like 20, you know, 25 or 30 weeks, which it gets really squishy for people or like people's do not like that. Right. And that yep. puts you in that doctor territory. Yeah, that's Democrat on defense. You start saying that Trump's going to ban birth control. That's Republic. That's Democrats on offense. Yeah. Uh, and and because people are like, and it goes to your point about going backwards. Like, what are you talking about? This has been available forever. This is a normal course of life. You're changing that. That feels weird. I think that is catalyzing. I will say, though, just to go back to something you're saying about, I personally think that the way that abortion ends up playing against Trump has got to be sort of the way it was in 2022 where it's not the thing, yeah. um, right? You to your point about him being sort of unpredictable, whatever, like it's not that he's just an election denier. It's not that he put three Supreme Court justices on the Supreme Court who overturned Roe v. Wade. It's that he's bonkers. It's <laughs> that he's nuts. And all of those things are like data points into why he's nuts and extreme and uh, absolutely unfit to be president. And I saw voters in 2022 reject that. Um, my my caveat to that is that it was an off year election in which the people who turn out just for Trump didn't turn out. And mm -hmm. so that's why it, it comes down to then really like an enthusiasm thing. And that's where I think Joe Biden's really vulnerable on this enthusiasm issue. But um, to the extent right. that abortion you... can play a role in that, that can be helpful. Right, right. I mean, how do you make every issue that you every point you have against Trump, how do you make it just like so exciting to voters and like, you know, when this guy's run twice already and like you've already made the case against him twice already. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think if Trump is the nominee, 
different story if it's DeSantis, like you said, or, you know, someone else. But if Trump's the nominee, the, the case against him has to be everything. It can't be just he's extreme on abortion because that's a hard picture to paint. It has to be he's a crazy guy. He's a kook. He's extreme. He's, you know, a criminal. <laughs> like, so, so yeah, I think it, I, I think it would be a, a lot more of an amalgam of things for sure. Yeah. All right. Elaine Godfrey, thank you so much for joining us. Check out Elaine's work at The Atlantic. She's one of my favorite people to read. Uh, and thanks to all of you for listening to the Focus Group podcast. 